You all know I'm not normally one for response videos, but at the moment, right now, I feel compelled. I usually prefer to talk about ideas and not the people who espouse them, but sometimes who is saying what matters. Especially if the ones chatting bad ideas hold any power, influence, or are, for example, respected scientists claiming to take the gobbledygook out of complex topics. So Sabina Hossenfelder has been on a bit of an arc, been having a bit of a moment, and not in any kind of good way. She was a theoretical physicist, author, journalist and musician and she currently runs the YouTube channel Science Without the Gobbledygook. I followed her for a while for her accessible summaries of complicated physics stuff. I liked her delivery as someone with a passing interest in space stuff. It was nice to see a woman communicate these ideas so effectively. She's someone who knows how to read a study and assess evidence. But as we so often see with people who have expertise in one field, she's gone and overreached. And it didn't start with autism. Before her video, Why Is Everyone Suddenly Neurodivergent?, she released Is Being Trans a Social Fad Among Teenagers? I won't be talking about that video here, but I have linked to Rebecca Watson's response to it below. But that video was a huge red flag that Sabina was willing to treat matters of life and death in the same, some people say this, others say that way that she does with other topics. And when we're dealing with ever-changing, highly politicised, currently extremely divisive topics which impact people's daily lives, rights and freedoms, these are questions of normativity, of humanity, of how individuals are being oppressed by numerous and complicated systems and biases. No amount of reading scientific reports can get to the bottom of that. I picked the windiest day to do natural lighting in a video. <laughs> to even treat such things as a debate with two equal sides is to take the side of the oppressive forces. It is to agree that human lives, people living their lives as themselves, is a matter for other people to debate. And then she did it with autism. I knew I'd end up making this video the first time I watched it. I knew I wouldn't be able to help myself. But trigger warning. Firstly, for history of eugenics and stuff, descriptions of oppression against disabled people. But I'm also going to be reading some pretty ableist things here. I'm going to be saying language which is outdated, pathologizing and oppressive and inaccurate. I reacted unscripted to this stuff and I wasn't able to stop and comment on every single instance of such language. There was so much, and it took me over five hours to film as it is. So just big old content warning. I did my best to make the most important criticisms known, but there are probably things I missed. And there are points where I had to kind of argue on their terms, so to speak. So for example, at one point I think I say, I have social deficits, which is something I wouldn't normally say. I'd normally go for difference. But yeah, I was trying to argue on their terms. So be forgiving, I was out of my comfort zone, but I really thought this needed countering ASAP. It was a lot of stress to make. It was pretty triggering for me and the edit was really hard to focus on. And if you have problems with focus and stress, then you're going to love today's sponsor, Endel. I have been quite stressed lately. Life has thrown a few things at me recently. And so I have been making regular use of today's sponsor, Endel. Endel is an app which provides highly customizable soundscapes to aid you in your goals, whether it be to relax, get better sleep, or to motivate yourself towards action and better focus. In fact, I used the dynamic focus soundscape while I was working on this script. And I genuinely found that it helped me focus on my work. And depending on what you're doing, you can customize it to get the exact vibes you're looking for. I was skeptical at first, I thought it would just be like some kind of lo-fi playlist or something, but it absolutely is not. It's so much better than any other kind of focusy, soundy, musicy type thing I've ever tried before. Endel uses generative technology to create personalized sound environments that suit your mood and activities. Informed by science and in collaboration with influential musical artists, Endel soundscapes can help you relax or focus. Especially if you're like me and you have neurodivergent reasons for struggling with focus or switching tasks. 
and other Endel users who have ADHD report that the app is super beneficial. Take your time to explore and tinker because once I got the hang of it, I've been using Endel throughout my day. I find the UI super cute as well. I literally had it on all day yesterday during an editing marathon and then used it as well at night to send me off into a deep sleep. So if you want to improve your focus and sleep, then please use the link in the description to get Endel today. The first 100 people to do so will get one free week of audio experiences. So click the link to enjoy more focus and better sleep now. Thanks to Endel for sponsoring this video. Let's get into it. The video has 937,000 views, by the way. It's been attributed to Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates and Eminem, none of whom ever said anything to deny or confirm it. What's going on? Why does everyone suddenly have autism? How is it different from Asperger's syndrome? What does neurodivergent mean? And what is internalized ableism? Am I autistic? That's what we'll talk about today. Okay, so the framing of, of the video is I'm gonna lay down all the facts about what all this neurodiversity stuff really is, right? It's very much a, I'm going to speak as an authority about all this, this confusing neurodiversity stuff you might have heard of. So I did skip over the first part of Sabina's video, which is about the history of autism. I could nitpick it there's a few things that are either misleading or just like glossing over stuff. She says symptoms a lot and we'd normally say traits. It's a very simplified version of the history, but that's not my main issue with this video. The really frustrating stuff comes after this bit. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, autism spectrum disorder is a mental health disorder. However, a lot of people with ASD and other conditions that have... I, I don't know if it does say that in the DSM. I mean, it is the diagnostic statistical whatever of mental disorders, but autism is a developmental disability. That's usually how it's classified. That's how it's classified by the CDC. Just a point. I don't know if it actually says in the DSM it's a mental health disorder or if she's just put that together because it's the manual of mental disorders. Additionally been labelled disorders fear that description is inappropriate. Just because they're not typical doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. The term that many of them prefer is that they are neurodiverse as opposed to neurotypical. The term neurodiverse refers to a group, whereas an individual would be described as neurodivergent. Neurodiversity includes not just ASD, but also attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, dyslexia, and a few other conditions. So neurodiversity includes everyone. So a group can be neurodiverse. It can be a neurodiverse group which means that there's people of lots of different neurotypes in that group. That, like, a group of just autistic people, if they're all just autistic, you, you wouldn't really call that a neurodiverse group. Like, a few points through the video, I feel like she thinks we use neurodivergent as, like, a one-for-one -one synonym for autism or autistic, which isn't really the case. I'm not sure if she's she's fully fully grasping the nuance there. Okay, so I know it might be confusing to people who are not already well versed in this, and I did recently make a video explaining the terms neurodiversity, neurodivergent, neurotypical, and the neurodiversity movement. But just quickly, neurodiversity describes the variety of all human neurology. Neurodivergent describes someone with a brain-based disability. Neurotypical is someone who isn't disabled in that way. And the neurodiversity movement is a civil rights movement for the protection and support of neurodivergent people. My full video on these terms is linked below. 
The term neurodiversity was coined in the late 1990s by the Australian sociologist Judy Singer, mostly based on the experiment. It wasn't the start of the movement. That was the, a coining of a word. And honestly, let's face it, it's an obvious word to pick for a movement that's going on about the, the variety of neurology. <laughs> I know she didn't directly credit her with starting the movement, but she didn't really go into the fact that this was an already existing movement, that there were disability rights movements already pushing this message. Singer argued that neurodivergent people had not been given their rightful place in society either, and it was about time to stop pathologizing them. The neurodiversity movement weaved together with the American social justice movement and developed an extremist part. They developed an extremist part together with the American civil rights movement. So what are these extremists up to, let's say? D are the result of normal natural variation in the human genome. By 2019, some said that the real problem is the dominant ableist culture of society that sets standards for what it means to be normal. An ableist is someone who believes that typical abilities are superior. If you're new... So some people said that it's that autism is a natural variety of the human genome, and other people said ableism within society is the real problem. Those are the extremist positions. So variety of people being normal and society being prejudice, those are extreme positions. Neurodivergent, but have internalized ableism, you may mistakenly blame yourself for the challenges you face when in fact the problem lies with the societal barriers and discrimination that make it harder for neurodivergent people to thrive. Internalized ableism is a thing and it's an issue, but that's not like the primary way that ableist society oppresses neurodivergent people. Is that what she said? That seems to be what she's saying. Like, oh, they're saying it's society and ableism's fault, which means internalized ableism. That's that's how that works. An ableist society is a that's a that's a systemic structural thing. I don't know if she was just like like, oh, this is what some people say. Anyway, now I'm gonna explain what internalized ableism is with no segue. They partnered with Google on a project called Missing to develop a database to identify genetic variants of autism. On their website, they described the project's mission as to identify many subtypes of autism with the goal of developing more personalized and effective treatments. Two years ago, the project was decried by some people on Twitter as eugenics, the Nazi doctrine of cleaning society from genetically inferior groups, which back then included disabled and autistic people. It seems to me that these tweets attacking the missing project were severely misrepresenting what the project website stated. Now okay, first, yeah, the, the Nazis, they were eugenicists, famously. But so was everyone else back then. There were eugenics societies and conferences in London and New York. It was it was a big thing. What the Nazis did was eugenicist genocide. But eugenics was it it was popular. So to to conflate the two like that as if it's eugenics was Nazi stuff. Which, like it was, but the effect of this is basically like if if they're saying this is eugenics, they're basically calling you a Nazi. That's what she's saying here. That's that's the that's the meaning you get from that is if people use the eugenics word, they're calling you a Nazi. They're calling autism speaks actual Nazis. How ridiculous. Eugenics is a set of beliefs and practices that aim to select genetic traits that are deemed desirable in the human population. As a concept, it predates Plato, and it only really began to fall out of favour after the full extent of Nazi crimes were uncovered. Before then, there were proud eugenicists throughout Western academia, science and politics. It was seen as a perfectly legitimate field of inquiry. And when I say it fell out of favour due to the Nazis, that's not to say it went away by any means. 
eugenics is still very much a thing. Prenatal screenings for disabilities are widely available. There are still forced sterilization programs across the world. And with the advent of gene editing research, new questions regarding the eugenicist nature of gene editing are up for debate. Eugenics is a widely used trope for dystopian sci-fi as the implications can be so broad and so terrifying. But one can be a eugenicist without being a murderous racist. And so to imply that this is a Nazi idea that only Nazis did is again ill-informed at best and downright dishonest at worst. It's still a dangerous idea, even when it's being done by not literal Nazis. And there are good reasons why the two so often go hand in hand. Nevertheless, Autism Speaks, which I remind you is a charitable organization that supports autistic people, has been labeled a hate group by some activists. This extreme position seems to be held by a small group that is vocal on Twitter, and I don't think it's representative for the neurodiversity community as a whole, but it's clearly a sentiment that exists. Sabina here is making it seem to her audience of one million people that the main reason that anyone has any criticism of Autism Speaks, which I remind you is a charitable organisation for the well-being of autistic people, is because of this, this one project, this missing project. Sabina, nine. Like it's just that one thing. They did a they did a genetics study, and a small minority of of Twitter Twitters got mad. That's all they did was this one genetics study thing, and just Twitter got mad and cancelled them <laughs> for being Nazis. The full story of why autistic people generally dislike Autism Speaks is a long one way too long for this already too long video. But in short, they famously ran campaigns which fearmongered about autism using very dehumanizing language. Their founder gave this interview where she recalled wanting to kill her autistic daughter and herself, and that the only reason she didn't was because she has another kid who isn't autistic. All the while, her autistic daughter was in the room, only meters away. The organisation has been a long-running supporter of ABA and research towards a cure, and until very recently there were no autistic people involved in the running of the organisation. Autism Speaks are still the largest and most powerful autism charity in the world, and their ambassadors regularly denounce the autism self-advocacy movement, including harassing people on social media. There are many other things, but to act like the hate is just in response to one research project is ill-informed at best and dishonest at worst. Fast forward to 2023 and TikTok is full of teenagers celebrating their neurodiversity, some of them self-diagnosed. Now you might say... Fast forward, TikTok is full of teenagers celebrating their neurodiversity, some of them self-diagnosed. There's nothing wrong with teenagers wanting to feel good about themselves. No. And I fully agree. The neurodiversity movement good. has a point. Our world a is built for typical people. A point? She's given us a point. And typical people are often not mindful of those who are less typical. In most cases, I think not so much because typical people are actively mean, but passively careless. If you're too tall or too short, too loud or too quiet or too anything really, you'll have trouble fitting in. Some people's brains don't work like yours, but that doesn't mean they are the problem. The problem might be that you're not making the necessary effort trying to understand them. Paying attention to those outside a standard deviation of the average makes their lives easier and enriches our society. I mean, yes, yeah, that a lot of autistic people's social issues is other people not putting in the effort, not meeting us where we're at. But is our one point that neurotypical people can sometimes be careless? Because she just talked about ableism and like sustainability societal ableism as if that like that just manifests as internalized ableism and now she's talking about ableism as if it's just the carelessness of neurotypicals like they don't want to be mean but like 
it's just hard because because you think differently. Seems to be brushing over quite a lot here. That sounds all well and good. Problem is that most neurodivergent people you see on TikTok are those well enough to produce TikToks. And in contrast to being queer or female, ASD can in severe cases significantly impair a person's ability to live independently. This is why the neurodiversity movement has seen somewhat of a backlash in recent years, primarily from caregivers of people with level 3 ASD who feel... This is why. Because teens on TikTok are the kinds of autistic people who are well enough to make TikToks. This is why the neurodiversity movement is receiving a pushback. The neurodiversity movement has always received a pushback. Essentialist thinking about human nature runs extremely deep. There is a whole industry which profits from scaring parents about the implications of their kids' autism. There are many interest groups who have interests in pushing back against a neurodiversity model. But no, according to Sabina, it's primarily the carers of autistic people with very high care needs. Yes, primarily from caregivers of people with level 3 ASD who feel like talking about internalised ableism doesn't help. For example, the London-based... Who feel like talking about internalised ableism doesn't help. One thing. Are you acting like that's, that's, that's the main thing we're on about? That's not... I don't know. That's weird. Neurobiologist Moa Constandi has written an article for Eon titled Against Neurodiversity, in which he draws attention to a worrying trend of romanticizing autism that has extended to other conditions that can be severe, debilitating and life-threatening, such as depression and schizophrenia. He writes... Romanticizing autism. It's literally just people asking to not be pathologized, to not be removed of humanity and the ability to take part in society, to show that they have value as a human being, talking about themselves. And anyone apparently romanticising other conditions like schizophrenia or depression, they have those things then, don't they? That's their experience, their lives. You can't say, oh, this is, this is doing damage because it's going to spread the wrong impression of the thing that you are experiencing. You talking about what you experience and how you experience it is going to give people the wrong impression about the thing that you experience. What you need is other people who don't experience the thing to explain what the, how the thing feels. You're ruining it. It's that the idea that autism is a variation of normal is at odds with scientific understanding of the condition, and that in their zealous pursuit of autistic rights, some advocates have become authoritarian and militant, harassing and bullying anyone who dares to portray autism negatively or expresses a desire for treatment or cure. <laughs> militant, okay. So saying it's normal is anti the scientific consensus says this person in this article. I'm going to have a closer look at that article af after this, after the video. It's almost done. Tom Clements, who is autistic himself, wrote in an opinion piece of The Guardian that men now self... He also wrote for Spiked magazine. ...identify as autistic as though autism were a fashion label rather than a debilitating disorder, and that such an attitude has led to the marginalisation of autistic people who, by virtue of their disability, are unable to speak and rely on others to do so on their behalf. Some neurodivergent people have pushed back. Here we go again with non-speaking autistic people have no voice. They need other people to speak on their behalf. If you think that non-speaking people have no voice, it's because you're not listening. This idea that the neurodiversity movement are talking over these people over here who are, who are really disabled and can't speak for themselves, you're literally just assuming that they are not an active part of our movement. And that's a you problem. It drives me nuts. I see it all the time and I only ever see it from neurotypical people 
people who want to speak for non-speaking autistic people but who aren't autistic themselves a lot of the time absolutely no no awareness of that contradiction whatsoever of a feeling um and that's not because I've, I've already prepared and read the article that I'm, I'm going to need to speak more about this particular subject of representation a little bit later on some neurodivergent people have pushed back pointing out that Clemens used the term high functioning to refer to himself and that such functioning labels should not be used because they suggest some people with ASD do not need help. Others complain that Clemens is a very active troll who spends a lot of time misrepresenting the neurodiversity movement and that he accuses autistic people of not actually being autistic. I didn't know anything about this when I started making this video. I was just trying to understand the symptoms of autism and had no idea the topic had become so controversial. You don't say. Sabina, I am shocked. Shocked to hear that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If you have, you've literally just, just heard of something, I'm assuming no more than a few weeks before she wrote this video. I had no idea about any of this, but I still feel like I can probably summarise a decades-long civil rights struggle, a nuanced and divisive political movement that is aiming to liberate and support some of the world's most vulnerable people. I think I can wrap my head around that in a couple of weeks and give one million followers a breakdown of everything that's going on. Also, as if those two things are the only criticisms people have of Tom Clements. <laughs> Is that him? I think he was, he was quote tweeting me one time about intersectionality, showing that he did not understand what it meant whatsoever, and I think I ratioed him and he blocked me. But I hope that this rundown helps you make a little sense of what's going on. In summary, autism spectrum disorder is a mental health condition that subsumes nope. what was previously called autism and Asperger's syndrome. It's more common than you might think, affecting more than one in a hundred people. Most of them are able to live a fairly normal life, but face challenges, especially at work and in social interactions. Many of them prefer to refer to themselves as neurodivergent and try to raise awareness for the challenges they are facing. But the neurodiversity movement has been criticised for trivialising the problems of those most severely affected. I'm annoyed. <sighs> So let's have a look at what seems to be one of the primary sources that Sabina used for the anti-neurodiversity argument. It's an essay called Against Neurodiversity in a magazine called Aeon. So let's have a look. I couldn't help feeling a little apprehensive before my meeting with Thomas Clements. It, it's a bit weird, like he... He meets with Thomas Clements, he introduces him, and I kind of thought that, like, Thomas would have more of an impact in the rest of the article, but honestly, I feel like it just happened so that our author could say he'd had more encounters with autistic people before writing this. The British 30-year-old has what used to be called Asperger syndrome and describes himself as slightly autistic. We'll see a lot of this throughout the article, but that's just not how it works. Until our meeting in London, I'd had few close encounters with autistic people. Are we aliens? <laughs> close encounters. So I wondered how to act, how he might respond to my actions. Would he make eye contact with me? Should I try to shake his hand? I just find that a very baffling um, first paragraph of an article where you're speaking as some kind of authority. Well, I've not had many close encounters with the, the subject of the civil rights movement I'm going to criticise, but still. I've met one now and he agrees with me. And so, like, it kind of goes on about just Tom. The article goes on about Tom for a bit. It's not very interesting. 
doesn't really add much to the overall argument of the essay, but it is a sign of things to come. Tom Clements is kind of known among neurodiversity advocates for being something of a troll. I tried to find his Twitter page, but it seems like it's been nuked. However, luckily for us, Neuroclastic has archived a bunch of his tweets for us. And they are basically exactly what you'd expect from a once regular contributor to Spiked magazine. The fact that he is being taken seriously by the anti-neurodiversity crowd is a real testament to how thin on the ground their position truly is. It quickly became apparent that Clements is remarkably gifted. Like most people with high-functioning autism, he is obsessed with a few subjects. That's just not true. Special interests is one, like, subset of the diagnostic traits. Many people get diagnosed with autism without having any special interests, so... Trigger warning, I guess, because very little effort is made to use up-to-date, let alone sensitive, language in this essay. So yeah, he is obsessed with a few of <laughs> him. Okay, yep, he's got interests, he's travelled, he likes travelling for masking reasons, uh, fluent in Mandarin and Cantonese, well, what sounded like fluent Mandarin and Cantonese, comprehensive knowledge, like, okay, we get it, remarkably gifted. His exceptional abilities are undoubtedly linked to being what he calls an Aspie, but he doesn't regard autism as a gift. For Clements, autism makes daily life more difficult. It is something he could do without. I'm yet, I'm not saying there's none out there, but I'm yet to meet an autistic person who says that they think autism makes their life easier. <laughs> as far as I'm aware from neurodiversity advocates, like, the position is not that we are, most of us are remarkably gifted, and in fact the, the superpower narrative is kind of frowned upon. I don't know many neurodiversity advocates who are, like, fully still in 2023 espousing the kind of idea that autism is a superpower or that you still occasionally see a comment that says something like, oh, I think autism is the next step in human evolution or whatever, but it's not, it's not in favour in mainstream neurodiversity circles at all. It's more just sort of individuals thinking about themselves. As I've said repeatedly, the neurodiversity movement is a disabled rights movement. But anyway, carry on. So Thomas is discussing his um, experience of autism and how it impacts him socially and um, opportunities for sex and finding a long-term sexual partner. Clements lives independently, but life for his younger brother Jack, who lies on the opposite end of the spectrum, is completely different. Again, that's not how the autistic spectrum is conceived of anymore. As I said, there's there's literally no effort to be up to date in the language or concepts used whatsoever. Clements wrote a book, um, self-published book, The Autistic Brothers, Two Unconventional Paths to Adulthood, where he talks about himself and his brother, including his brother's need for toilet assistance. Okay, so AST is a condition, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay, the DSM lists three severity levels for ASD based on the extent of impairment and restricted repetitive patterns of behavior. Okay, so this, this paragraph <laughs> bugs me, right? Because on the one hand, he's, he's being accurate, like he's, these are quotes from the DSM. However, the wording, the diagnostic criteria for level one autism. And like, he said ASD up here, but like, I don't know if he says it anymore. I feel like he doesn't say it much after that. So the diagnostic criteria for level one autism include, level two includes, and like, level three. It's not wrong. There, There is a part, oh, I'll bring it up on screen. There is a part of the DSM where it is a table on how to decide as, as a psychologist, how to decide whether someone needs the diagnosis of ASD 1, 2, or 3. And these are quotes from that child. <laughs> However, he makes he makes it seem, I feel like he makes it seem that there are different diagnostic criteria for these different levels. 
Do you, do you see what I mean? As if there are whole different like things that the person is marking. But it's not. It's literally just... It's the same criteria. It's the exact same diagnostic criteria. By the way, this isn't me like defending the diagnostic process or anything. I'm just saying he's... It seems to me like he's kind of muddying the water a little bit there. I can't tell if it's intentional or not. But it just doesn't read like um, that we're talking about how much the person's life is impacted. Because like level one autism includes difficulty initiating social interactions, atypical unsuccessful responses, problems organizing and planning. Level two includes marked deficits in verbal and non-verbal communication skills. So like it, autism one is initiating social reactions and unsuccessful responses to social reactions. Level two includes deficits in verbal and non-verbal communication. I, I, I have a diagnosis of ASD one. I have deficits in verbal and non-verbal social communication skills that's marked on my diagnosis. Markedly odd non-verbal communication. So it's, it's like, I don't know, different things are being picked to make it seem like the, the, there's differences in the traits being diagnosed rather than just how it's impacting the individual's life. Like difficulty coping with change is, is something that all autistic people um, experience. Distress or difficulty changing focus or action, that's another thing, like, this is all on my chart because you don't just get, like, a level, you don't get diagnosed just with a level, you get a full report on the ways that, that you, you are autistic, <laughs> like, what has been noted during the diagnostic process, which is pretty in-depth. And like you can see like the difference between level two and level three here it you can see it's, it's it's more like very limited severe deficits extreme difficulty coping with change but like things were left out of the level one paragraph there i feel people diagnosed with level three autism he's just continuing with the level one level two level three autism uh, tend to have great difficulty interacting with others and can appear to lack social skills altogether. At least he said appear to. For example, the DSM-5 describes a person with few words of intelligible speech who rarely initiates interaction and when he or she does, makes unusual approaches to meet needs only and responds only to very direct social approaches adding that such individuals require very substantial report in their daily lives. Okay, it's not adding that. That's the point of ASD3, is that people with ASD3 require very substantial support. That's, that's what the, the, the levels are, is support needs. By contrast, people with level 1 autism can function independently with some support. What it actually says is, without supports in place, deficits in social communication cause noticeable impairments. Without support, noticeable impairments. Problems of organising and planning hamper independence. Inflexibility of behaviour causes significant interference with functioning inflexibility of behavior and like literally up here he only includes that in level two and level three i'm finding it difficult to believe that this isn't just purposeful cherry picking to be honest oh yeah they, they're basically independent with some support like what does that mean some support it doesn't say some support it says support and without support. Significant interference with functioning. Level 3 corresponds closely to the 11 cases reported by the Austrian-American psychiatrist Leo Kanner in his classic paper from 1943, while Level 1 corresponds to the mild form of autism described by the Austrian paediatrician Hans Asperger in the 1930s. Austrian paediatrician Hans Asperger. German physician Joseph Mengele. 
Now, to be fair, the author does point out Asperger's Nazi ways, but what isn't pointed out is why his Nazi ways are one of the primary reasons why we don't like people using the term Asperger's syndrome anymore. Hans Asperger only managed to become a renowned paediatrician after his mentor Franz Hamburger, a Nazi party member, purged his staff of all Jewish individuals and most women. There is recorded documentation of Asperger's affinity with the Nazi doctrine of race hygiene and that he saw his work as an important step towards these goals. He joined several Nazi-affiliated groups and openly admired several key players in the Nazi genocide machine. He publicly supported race hygiene measures and on several occasions actively participated in the genocide of disabled people by sending dozens of children to be murdered. In 1940, Asperger became a medical expert in Vienna and was responsible for diagnosing hereditary diseases and proposing forced sterilization in the interest of the Nazi eugenics program. One analysis of Asperger's referrals at the time noted that he was not more benevolent towards his patients than his peers and that in the majority of cases, Asperger made harsher judgments than other doctors towards the children and adolescents he examined. Those children would be sent to the infamous Am Spiegelgrund Clinic in Vienna where 789 patients were murdered under the Child Euthanasia Program. However, Asperger noted that several people who would have fallen under his diagnosis of autistic psychopathy had gone on to do important work in the fields of science and art, particularly one influential professor of astronomy, and so it occurred to him that such people might be put to work in benefit of Nazi scientific programs. And that's why the world ended up with the distinction between autism and Asperger's syndrome. And I hope it's now obvious why we no longer use that term. Notice though, that from now on, level two autism is, is not in the picture anymore because that would, that would complicate matters, wouldn't it? They very much want to create a divide between the level one and the level three. The, the level ones keep talking and the level threes can't so what we really need is neurotypicals i guess to speak for all of us it gets worse about 40 percent of children with autism do not talk at all i could not find this statistic anywhere that 40 percent of children with autism do not talk at all and he does not provide it According to the CDC, about 40% of children with autism do not talk at all. But it doesn't say that here. I don't see it in the in the link that's hyperlinked in that sentence. And like I looked online and the estimations for autistic people who don't speak are I think between 20 and 35%. Um he, he the statistics here. So this is autism prevalence, one in 160 children worldwide has autism, about how the increase in prevalence is um, likely due to improved awareness, expansion of diagnostic criteria, better diagnostic tools and improved reporting. Despite lengthy research, I could find no figures regarding how many of those diagnosed with autism fall into each of the three severity levels. <laughs> okay, there's, but there's probably a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, because it's ASD 1, 2, and 3 is sort of a recent diagnostic change. So there will be a lot of autistic people out there who weren't placed into one of three levels. But also, because that's not how they work. They're not boxes that you are put into and which you stay in. They're not these clearly, strictly defined categories. An individual over the course of their life can fluctuate between. It's basically an indication of the amount of support a person's going to need. But life events and stuff can change, health can change, and so how much care an autistic person needs over the course of their life can fluctuate a great deal. But that can't be acknowledged if what you're trying to do is divide autistic people into really autistic and kind of fine actually shut up 
Okay, yeah, so according to the CDC, 40% of children with autism do not talk at all. And at least a quarter acquire basic language, but then lose it. So that, that is a thing with, um, with non-speaking autistic people is that, and non-speaking non-autistic people, in very early childhood, they might acquire a few words and then at some point stop speaking. But the statistics go on. The results of a study in Australia published in 2016 are somewhat consistent with the estimate. It found that 26.3% of autistic children sampled were using fewer than five spontaneous functional words by the end of the study. How is that somewhat consistent with the estimate that 40% of children don't talk at all? 36% exited the study not using two word phrases. And then parent reports indicated that 30% were not naming at least three objects consistently. 43% were not using phrases with a noun and a verb consistently. So these are all, these are all different metrics. And yeah, like I say, the estimate for adults who are non or minimally speaking is I think around 20 to 35%. So like why he's got in bold here that 40% of children with autism don't speak at all, I, I don't know. Unless he's trying to like skew things, then it would make sense. Autism often presents with comorbidities. More than half of children with ASD, oh, we used ASD, also have an intellectual disability. And up to half exhibit symptoms of ADHD. Might actually be higher than that. Autistic children are psychiatrically hospitalized much more frequent than others, with 13% of their hospital visits being due to psychiatric problems, compared to 2% for children without ASD. In autistic adults, the lifetime prevalence of anxiety and depression is 42% and 37% respectively. Autism also commonly occurs with epilepsy, with the highest rate in those whose IQ is below 40. But all of these things are true of people who have an ASD1 diagnosis as well. Because there's not actually any breakdown here, this is just of autistic people, autistic adults. Um, but I feel like the way that it's written is kind of leading you to believe that these are risks that people like me aren't really facing. Autism is arguably one of the most controversial subjects of our time. Is it? <laughs> okay. Due partly to a lack of understanding of its causes, current discourse on the subject is a narrative jungle strewn with young, overgrown and ill-conceived ideas jostling for a spot in the sun including uncompassionate refrigerator mothers, microbial infections, vaccinations, and environmental pollutants and toxins to name but a few. Okay, but, all right, I'm gonna nitpick the shit out of this. Okay, that's not current discourse. That has been the mainstream scientific research on autism that did all this. All of these things were like genuine theories by pretty ableist autism researchers in the past. And they have infiltrated discourse, I guess, currently. There are still people out there who think that environmental pollutants and toxins are why their kid's autistic. It's not that no research was done and people have just started doing discourse guessing. All of this was the result of so-called scientific research. And in fact, I just um, read an essay, uh, which I will link in the description, um, by some autistic autism researchers that details how ableist assumptions have repeatedly throughout history led to just very, very bad science being done at autistic people's expense. And that the idea that to be anti-ableist is to hinder science somehow is backwards. Ableism has hindered the science and these are results of the science. So into this maelstrom came the neurodiversity movement whose advocates celebrate autism as a gift that is an integral part of our identity. I had to take a break if I look different and the blue light was giving me a headache. Where were we? So the article he linked to that supposedly celebrates autism as a gift, 
doesn't really. It's actually quite an in-depth discussion about how stereotyping autism can have really dangerous consequences for autistic people, including us not getting as much pain medicine or anaesthetics as other people because we express our pain in different ways. But go off, King. But yes, that is an integral part of identity. Yeah, yeah, I would say we say that. It's an autism is an integral part of my identity. See, this is the the issue when it comes to talking about treatments and cures and identity and how people feel about their own autism because it's really difficult as an autistic person to try and imagine yourself without autism. I could imagine myself without the parts of autism I don't like, maybe. I could imagine myself not having meltdowns. I could imagine myself n not being overwhelmed by certain things. But autism affects so much of your being that it inevitably is a part of the parts of yourself that you like. So it's, yeah, it's, it's murky at the best of times. All right, so what else? What else do we do? They promise to make the voices of autistics heard and to improve their quality of life by making the world more accepting of and accommodating for them after decades of being marginalised and victimised. Yes. Agreed. Well, uh, right, okay, so, no. <laughs> you pick. <laughs> the neurodiversity movement is not just about autistic people. This is another thing that I think Sabina and this person keep conflating, that the autistic self-advocacy movement is the neurodiversity movement, and that like neurodivergent is just a synonym for autistic, which is wrong. Again, you can see my video explaining those terms. However, in recent years, there has been a backlash against this. Like, making the world more accepting of and accommodating after decades of being marginalised, however, there is a backlash against this. Growing numbers of people are now speaking out against the neurodiversity movement, claiming that it does not represent them, and more importantly, that it ignores the plight of those with severe autism. The term neurodiversity was coined in the late 90s by sociologist Judy Singer, who argued that autistic people have been oppressed in much the same way as women and gay people and suggested that their brains are merely wired differently from those of neurotypical or non-autistic people. And again, I don't, I, I honestly didn't read anything of Judy Singer. Maybe she says, maybe she does this, but neurotypical or non-autistic people. Neurotypical does not mean non-autistic. I don't know if they're, they're saying it does here, but it seems like they are, but that's not true. The movement is an extension of the civil rights movement and the deaf pride movement that emerged after the introduction of cochlear implants. Writing in the Atlantic magazine in 1998, investigative journalist Harvey Bloom said, neurodiversity may be every bit as crucial for the human race as biodiversity for life in general. I would agree with that, but like to say neurodiversity may be every bit as crucial for the human race isn't to say autism is every bit as crucial to the, for the human race. He actually, this whole article is called Against Neurodiversity, and yet it's completely focused on autism. In the past decade, neurodiversity's popularity has grown enormously, largely because of the buzz surrounding Steve Silverman's book Neurotribes. It's also grown in popularity because it's undoubtedly just a fact about human existence that human brains are diverse. That's what neurodiversity means. Because he's he's now conflating as well the neurodiversity movement and neurodiversity as a concept. The neurodiversity movement is a disability rights movement. It is a civil rights movement, which does aim to mainstream the idea of neurodiversity. But neurodiversity is just a word to describe human neurology. Today, the internet and mass media are replete with articles proclaiming the benefits of employing people with autism who have hidden potential that can benefit endeavors such as branding and design. All right. If only we can stop thinking of them as being disabled. 
I'm not saying that no autistic person has ever said that they don't consider autism to be a disability. I know that that has been said, but it is one. Some people can be less disabled by it. They can feel less disabled, but in general, it's a disability. Just as with lots of different types of disabilities, individuals who might be very well supported or who just like, aren't affected so much by whatever reason might say that to them they're not disabled by this. Maybe there's other things in their life that they find way more disabling than their disability. But that's just, that's not a mainstream idea in the neurodiversity movement that autism is not a disability. It's just not true. This this is like a, a, a super sort of, I don't know, kind of like Americanized liberal, yeah, gifted child indigo child they're like they have was it specially abled or whatever kind of nonsense and that's something which other disability rights movements push against as well of like language like differently abled or specially abled and stuff because it undermines their struggles and that message of like stop calling us special comes from usually the disabled community i just i just it's it's people who have not spent any time immersed in the neurodiversity movement or in disability rights movements in general who say things like this, who conflate all these ideas and write their silly little essays about it. This way of thinking has now entered the mainstream. In the US, for example, representatives of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network have advised federal government policymakers on how they believe issues such as healthcare and community integration will affect autistic people. Good. And in the UK, the Labour Party in 2018 launched an Autism Neurodiversity Manifesto with the social model of disability as one of its key principles. Good. Now, I'm not a social model absolutist. I actually am very resistant to people who take a purely social model view of disability, even when it comes to things like autism and ADHD, because I think that is reductive and ignores the desires of the individual. Even in a perfect society, there will probably be things that I want to be able to do but struggle to be able to do because of my disabilities. So. Um, but also, um, <laughs> I wouldn't worry too much about the UK Labour Party um, taking strides towards neurodiversity acceptance. <laughs> Different kinds of people are in charge now. <laughs> On the face of it, this sounds admirable. The neurodiversity movement has indeed empowered many with autism. Autism is not just about autism. Most recently, the young climate campaigner, Greta. The thing is, I've, I've heard Greta pronounce her last name and I know I'm gonna do it wrong. It's like Thunberg or something. Thunberg. Greta Thunberg. Who described it as her superpower. She can do that. Like I'm not against anyone saying that they feel empowered by their autism. Go ahead. But it's, Again, it's not the mainstream view. And like, is that all the good, like, okay, this, on the face of it, this does sound admirable. After all, they made Greta feel good about herself. <laughs> but the movement is proving to be harmful in a number of ways. Is that, is that the only good thing that he could think of was, well, Greta seems happy. <laughs> Greta is a, relatively wealthy, well-supported young woman who I'm a big fan of. I love her. I think she's doing great things. But she kind of, her life is her special interest and she's been supported in this. And so, you know, I can completely understand why she would, and I think that's an old quote by her. I don't know what she thinks now, but I could see why somebody like Greta does think of it as a superpower, the ability to focus on a thing over time and sort of do something that's really important to you. And I think that often when someone is very well supported with their autism, where they're a supportive family and the material means by which they can kind of create an environment and a life that is good for them, 
then yeah, I can I can completely understand why certain elements of your autism might feel like you can just do things better than other people can, or more intensively than other people. To see the world in different ways and all that kind of stuff, I love it. There's so much room for it. But when bad faith readings of that are portrayed in the way that it's being portrayed in this article and Sabina's video makes me mad. It makes me mad when disabled people expressing any kind of like joy about their lives is seen as like being harmful. <laughs> But the movement is proving to be harmful in another in a number of ways. It made some people feel good, but it's the same like when working class people have fun and like spend some money. Just waves of judgment. <laughs> How dare you? When fat people show love for their own body, waves of judgment. You're doing harm. It's at this point that this article takes a pretty hard right turn towards pissing me off spill. <laughs> so just prepare yourself. I might get a bit heated. Firstly, neurodiversity adverts can romanticize autism. While many with the mild forms of autism might lead relatively normal daily lives with little or no assistance, many who are more severely affected cannot function properly without round the clock care. Yet, John Marble, the self-advocate and founder of Pivot Diversity, an organisation in San Francisco that aims to pivot autism towards solutions which empower autistic people, their families and employers, posted on Twitter in 2017, <laughs> There is no such thing as severe autism! Just as there is no such thing as severe homosexuality or severe blackness. It doesn't link to the tweet. Could Google it, couldn't I? 61 whole likes. Pivot Diversity has 1,131 followers. I don't love the tweet. I, I don't much like it when people make comparisons with like other forms of bigotry or whatever. But come on, it's just a tweet. I, mean, I think the idea behind like saying that there's no such thing as severe autism is a social model view and it's it's more to do with people needing more help with more things. And also there's a tendency for people to say severe autism when what they actually mean is someone with ASD3 and also multiple other disabilities, which is a big problem. And we'll actually get onto this later, but there you are, a quote tweet with 61 likes by the founder of an organization with a thousand followers. Worryingly, this trend, <laughs> what trend? You pointed to one tweet. Uh, okay. <laughs> Worryingly, this trend of romanticizing autism has extended to other conditions that can be severe, debilitating, and life-threatening. There are now groups of self-advocates who celebrate depression and schizophrenia. This could also be related to the growth of pro-anorexia websites, as well as the more recent emergence of addiction pride. There's no links here, there's no examples given here. I searched for addiction pride, I didn't see anything. Like I know that like websites, web pages with advice on how to lose weight, like drastic weight has, that's been a thing since the internet. Like I remember that when I was at school. I've never seen groups that celebrate depression and schizophrenia. I've seen self-advocacy groups who want to raise awareness, who might sometimes find some joy in their lives and share that with the world. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. He's offered no examples here and it does seem like he's like blaming this stuff on the neurodiversity movement somehow, which I, I don't know, that's yet to be shown. It occurred to me that maybe he's talking about Mad Pride, which grew around the same time as the neurodiversity movement, but is its own thing. Mad Pride aims to challenge and change the way society conceives of mental health and to end stigmatization. There was a time when admitting that you are struggling mentally in any way at all was an embarrassing thing that nobody would dream of doing. This is still the case for many people. And stigmatization is something very much missing from this essay. 
There's no real discussion of it. This isn't all about how disabled we are or are not. Our ways of being are heavily stigmatized by others. Even subtle autistic traits are things which, overall, society still shuns. And historically, stigmatized people have found power in reclaiming the tools of their marginalization. The slurs used to describe them can be redefined. Showing pride in the parts of ourselves which society has deemed inappropriate is political activism. It's power. The idea that autism is a variation of normal is at odds with scientific understanding of the condition. Oh, I have thoughts. Let's read the paragraph first. The general consensus among neuroscientists is that autism has neurodevelopmental origins. Sure. With recent research showing that it is associated with abnormalities in brain cell numbers and white matter structure and deficits in synaptic pruning, the process by which unwanted synaptic connections are eliminated. Uh, yes, I've heard of these studies. The research also shows that genetics plays a major role. Each autistic individual carries a large number of very rare or unique gene variants, together with extra copies of genes, deleted genes, and other chromosomal disruptions. Some of these are inherited, while others are generated anew at fertilization and during the earliest stages of development. Thus, it seems that every person with autism harbors a unique combination of such genetic variations which manifest as a unique set of behavioral symptoms. Tell me why a unique combination of genetic variations isn't normal. Hear me out. Because all is done here is showed that our brains are different, which we could have told you. But like, why is that not normal? Why is it not normal for some humans to be born with different brains for a huge variety of reasons? Tell me what evolution is. Tell me what, tell me how humans evolve and develop, if not for unique combinations of genetic variation. So I don't, I don't understand how he's saying, well, this is the idea that it's a variation and like a normal variation is at odds with science. And then just saying it's, it's just, it's a variation, it's a genetic. So I don't think that he's, with these examples proved that this isn't true. Genetic variation and unique combinations is the story of all human development. And we've got another bold, another bold piece of text. Neurodiversity advocates label those who express a desire for treatment or cure as Nazis and eugenicists. He's not couching his language anymore, is he? There's no sometimes or can anymore. Okay, so however, neurodiversity advocates reject the medical model of autism in favor of an as yet undetermined social model that blames the problems faced by autistic people on systematic ableist discrimination. Like how is the social model as yet undetermined? Don't really know why he's feigning so much confusion of the social model. The social model doesn't just apply to autism, but loads of disabilities. If you don't have wheelchair accessible buildings in society, the wheelchair users are more disabled. You had wheelchair using kids in the States crawling up the stairs of the Capitol to illustrate the social model of disability. There's nothing yet undetermined that blames systematic ableism. Okay. Some of their reasons for doing so are valid. So, some. Historically, autistic people have existed on the margins of society and have been victimized by the medical industrial complex that aimed to coercively eliminate them and others considered to be disabled. For example, Asperger was complicit in the Nazi regime's euthanasia program for disabled children. Yes, he was, and I am glad that he didn't um, circle round that in any way. He was complicit, there's no debate on that. But how can you sort of cast suspicion on the undetermined social model that blames ableist discrimination? And then outline how, yes, actually historically, <laughs> we, we face that discrimination. Oh, here we go. 
Since then, the medical view of autism has changed dramatically. Researchers and clinicians do not want to eradicate autism. They aim to understand it in order to develop treatments for those who want them. So he's saying that, well, historically, maybe this social model stuff had a point when there were literal Nazis literally murdering you, but that's not the case anymore. Researchers and clinicians are nice now. <laughs> Neurodiversity advocates recently have been running a campaign called Stop the Shock. Maybe he wants to look into that. Stop the Shock is a campaign dedicated to ending the use of aversive therapy and electric shock devices on individuals with disabilities and for raising public awareness about the detrimental consequences of aversive conditioning utilizing electric shock devices at the Judge Rotenberg Center in Canton, Massachusetts. This unscientific practice involves administering electric skin shocks to individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities, devoid of any basis in legitimate medical science. According to this update on the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, in December 2022, Congress included an amendment in the end-of-year omnibus bill which affirmed the FDA's right to ban contingent electrical shocks used for behaviour modification. This is a direct result of decades of advocacy from self-advocates like you. ASAN is relieved to see that after years of relentless advocacy by the disabled community, Congress has listened to survivors, advocates and allies and formally acknowledged the FDA's power to pass a ban on the device. This is a victory, but we cannot close this chapter in history yet. The FDA must now ban the electric skin shock device again in order to hashtag stop the shock. Autistic children and disabled children in general are at a heightened risk of filicide. According to ASAN, over the past five years, over 550 disabled people have been murdered by their parents, relatives or caregivers. Abuse in care facilities is still a largely unaddressed problem, which is only exacerbated by the increase of unregulated private services. And it has been noted that a strongly pathologizing public perception tends to lead to a general apathy about the lives of disabled people. We need more investment into high quality services for disabled people and their caregivers. We need more oversight and regulations, but disabled people need to be the ones leading this progress. Nothing about us without us. The anti-neurodiversity crowd want us nowhere near our own advocacy. They want to decide what is best for us. Despite many important medical advances, there is still a lack of understanding of the causes of autism, which leaves many parents desperate and makes them willing to try just about anything to help their children. Consequently, there is a huge market for ineffective or untested treatments and quack remedies. Yes, there are a big part of that. And, and the key here is, and this is something else, right? Throughout this article, and you'll, you'll find it elsewhere as well in anti-neurodiversity discussions, is the hyper-focus on children. And I can't help but think that that might be because you're not going to get many autistic adults um, agreeing with this stuff. And also because when you're dealing with developmental stuff, people de develop? When you're talking about developmental stuff, I think it's a little bit disingenuous to only talk about kids like 80% of the time because kids do develop, even disabled people develop, even people with developmental disabilities develop. But yes, there is a huge market for ineffective and dangerous quack remedies. A big part of the reason why that is, is because we pathologize autism to no end, calling it an epidemic, acting like it tears families apart. You've got doctors and educators telling families as soon as their child is diagnosed, that's it. They'll never be able to do this. They'll never be able to do that. That's your fa All your finances are going to go on care for the rest of their lives. That, that happens. So yeah, he goes on about some of the ineffective quack cures for autism. Neurodiversity advocates still label those who express a desire for treatment or cure as Nazis and eugenicists. When we fight for autism rights, we are fighting for our continued existence, wrote the self-advocate Jackson Connors in the People's World newspaper this June against our dehumanization, 
against a cure which is a dog whistle for ableist eugenics and against the systems that push so many of us to poverty and suicide. He's outlined that basically science is at a loss when it comes to trying to cure autism. As I said before, all those examples of like weird ideas about autism, that was, that was mainstream science that came up with those ideas. Despite many important medical advances, there is still a lack of understanding of the causes. He listed all the ways that our brains are different and then also admits that no one has a clue. <laughs> but that's not the neurodiversity movement's fault. It's not for want of trying. They have been trying to find a cure at the expense of autistic people. Autistic people have been killed by autism research. And so neurodiversity advocates who are wanting to uh, fight against the systems that push so many of us to poverty or, and suicide, you want to fight against our dehumanization. How can you not see that that is absolutely necessary work? And when autism advocates talk about cures being dog whistles for eugenics, right? That's because they understand the science as it currently is. Like, at the minute, there is no cure or treatment for autism. We know that it's genetic. Like, we know all these biomarker things that he's outlined. And so, at the minute, as it currently stands, the only possible, literally possible way to cure autism would be prenatal screenings. That is eugenics. <laughs> Maybe in the future, um, gene editing will be a way that we could treat or cure autism. I don't know. But what I do know is that the neurodiversity movement and autistic advocates on Twitter are not standing in the way of gene editing research. They're not endangering that in any way at all. There is interest in gene editing, the, the scope is much broader than autism and whether I agree with it or not, it's, it's going to happen. That research will get funded. To pretend that autism advocates are going to stand in the way of that is ridiculous. But yeah, any research which aims to identify genetic markers that can be screened for prenatally, tell me why that's not eugenics. <laughs> Wanting to fight against our dehumanization and against systems that push us to poverty and suicide in their zealous pursuit of autistic rights. He really, like, I don't know, really, did he not read this through or does it just, like, really not, like... <laughs> Some advocates have become authoritarian and militant. What do words mean? <laughs> Who knows? Some advocates have become authoritarian and militant, harassing and bullying anyone who dares to portray autism negatively or expresses a desire for a treatment or a cure. This extends to autism researchers in academia and the pharmaceutical industry, and also to the parents of severely autistic children. I think there probably is a bit of bullying that happens sometimes online. Individuals who um, maybe do go after people a bit much, I don't know. I don't love it, I don't like seeing people get harassed. And yeah, maybe some people on Twitter can, can be a bit zealous, who knows? But when the subject at hand is your humanity, when you are at risk of poverty and suicide, and institutionalization and unemployment and bullying and ostracization and all the other things that he mentioned that we are like at, at risk of yeah when when the subject up for discussion is your your basic humanity and your civil rights i'm not sure people being a bit zealous and mean online is our biggest um biggest problem but if it is and maybe like maybe this guy he's just really anti-people being mean to other people online. Maybe. We'll see. Let us not pretend that online meanness is any kind of a one-way street. On one hand, you've got absolutely cloutless disabled people venting their frustration at having to read some more dehumanizing nonsense about themselves. 
but so often on the other do we have influential people attacking random no follower accounts. Celebrities who have some skin in the charity ambassador game, like William Shatner for example, exposing any critic to harassment by his millions of followers. Sia, before she realised how badly she had messed up, was doing the same. And this anti-neurodiversity gang, the guys who liked to call themselves the autistic dark web, are rampant on social media, harassing and attacking neurodiversity advocates, often with vile language and making arguments which are steeped in conservative bigotry. And there is a trend of insinuating that disabled self-advocates aren't really disabled. Autistic self-advocate Chloe Hayden recently received death threats for posting a video of her expressing joy. And then there's the popularity of things like r slash fake disorder cringe. And I know that just for mentioning that subreddit, I'll probably get some comments that are like, Well, some people are faking it and it is cringe. As if identifying a few alleged fakers is worth the harm and upset caused to so many disabled people when their content ends up there. The idea that neurodiversity advocates are the bullies in this equation is frankly absurd to me. One widely used treatment is Applied Behavioural Analysis, ABA, which involves intensive one-on-one -on -one therapy aimed to develop social skills. However, neurodiversity advocates consider ABA to be cruel and unethical and campaign for withdrawal of government funding for treatment. Furthermore, they are trying to legitimise self-diagnosis of autism. Right. Just, just says it's a widely used treatment. Neurodiversity advocates consider it to be cruel and unethical and campaign for withdrawal. You're not wondering why that is, Chief? No, no, no history on ABA there. No, no explanation. It's, still, I just, it's just therapy sessions aimed to develop social skills. What could be wrong with that? <laughs> Literally no background, no reasons why. Just that we consider it to be cruel and unethical. Like, there's no, there's no um, data to look at. There's no studies or anything um, done on the rates of PTSD from people who've been through ABA or anything. There's no easily accessible history that would show you that its roots are the exact same as conversion therapy, or that the guy who developed it didn't think that autistic people were fully human or anything. No, it's just these neurodiversity advocates considering things. Furthermore, they are trying to legitimise self-diagnosis of autism. Quote, Neurotypicals continue to dominate the conversation and speak over autistic voices, which ultimately reinforces a pathologising viewpoint about us. Yes, and centres around the idea that somehow we fundamentally cannot speak for ourselves. Yes. Wrote Solvig Standall on the Thinking Person's Guide to Autism blog this April. Standall continues, Yes, ultimately some of us will come to realise that they are not really autistic, but the exploration still helps them find answers about themselves, and no one is harmed in the process. No one is harmed in the process. Literally, no one is. If someone wrongly diagnoses themselves with autism, literally the only possible harm from that action is that person has inconvenienced themselves or potentially has, I don't know, missed something that might have a treatment option, potentially. However, when we deny someone's autistic identity, we shut them out of the whole process deny them access to the tools they need to better access the healthcare system and potentially deny them their formal diagnosis altogether. Like, can you read, person who wrote this? Can you read the essay you put together? It... This paragraph that he uses as an example of the, the, the problematic legitimization of self-diagnosis is, like, nothing here is not true or not valid. It's even like, yeah, maybe sometimes you're going to be wrong, but no harm is done. And like acknowledging that it's often the first step towards a formal diagnosis. Like, I really don't know what's problematic here. I think it's just assumed that, that self-diagnosis is bad, I guess. And so any paragraph 
that isn't condemning self-diagnosis is an example of the bad, I suppose. While many among the autism researchers are aware of these problems and find the situation extremely frustrating, very few are willing to speak up for fear of jeopardising their research funding, offending a highly sensitive patient and parent population, or being targeted for harassment themselves. Like, what, what do you mean you're, will you're unwilling to speak up for fear of jeopardising your research? I don't know, what, what, what does that look like? Scientists standing up in a conference and going, I must say that the online neurodiversity advocates are really mean. In recent years, however, a growing number of parents and carers have begun speaking up against the neurodiversity movement. Parents and carers saying that the way its advocates portray autism does not resonate with their own experiences of the condition, their own indirect experience. Autistic people talking about their autism doesn't resonate with my experience of somebody else's autism. <laughs> One of them is Bruce Hall, 65 year old father of twins Jack and James, 18 in California. The boys both have severe autism and intellectual disabilities and their behavior has always been very challenging, Hall told me. Up to the age of nine, James would throw tantrums and scream for hours. Tantrums, all right. He can speak a little now, although you wouldn't understand much of it. Jack doesn't speak at all. I'm not going to judge any of these parents, but I, I do judge a little bit any parent of an autistic kid who calls their meltdowns tantrums. Like, I don't know this man. But I do know that he and his wife Valerie published a book called Immersed, Our Experience with Autism describing in detail daily life with their children. So both examples so far of anti-neurodiversity supporters, so a supporter of an anti-neurodiversity advocates. <laughs> both examples are people who have published books about their autistic relative, detailing the intimate personal lives of their autistic relatives. So that's nice. I think the idea that it's okay to publish the intimate details of an individual's personal life so long as that person is disabled is something we need to problematize right now. Yesterday, in fact. We've had this conversation about family vlogs, about the consent of the children involved. We've heard stories from these kids as they've grown into adulthood about the negative consequences this exposure had on them. But YouTube is still absolutely full of autism family content, which typically, although not always, but often highlights meltdowns and other stressful moments for extra clicks. And let's not even get into how problematic it is for parents to have an incentive towards producing dramatic content like that. Non-autistic-led advocacy so often forgets that autistic kids become autistic adults. And time and time again, we hear from autistic adults who are non-speaking, learning disabled and with high care needs, talk about how for their whole childhood, it was assumed that they were incapable of thought, incapable of independent opinions and desires, incapable of so much when they knew themselves that they were simply without the material tools to succeed. We hear testimony from these people who have had to sit in rooms their whole lives, with people speaking about them as if they're not there, but who, when provided with the necessary supports, show just how many wrong assumptions were made about them. All people have a right to privacy. This is what we want more of, I guess, according to the writer of this essay. This is a good thing. Autistic people self-advocating, this is bad. In public, the boys may throw a fit at any moment. We can't predict it and we can't be certain of the cause. It could be because of the lights or the sounds or the number of people around. It could be because they don't feel well or because they're just tired. It could be a combination of these things or none of them. Even typical kid-friendly entertainments do not ensure that the boys will react positively. Their understanding of situations is limited as is their tolerance. What normal kids consider... <laughs> normal kids. <laughs> what normal kids consider fun, autistic kids may consider baffling and terrifying. <laughs> I consider you baffling and terrifying, not judging. 
The disconnect between the neurodiversity narrative and the experiences of severely affected autistics led another group of advocates to establish the National Council on Severe Autism, based in San Jose in California and launched earlier this year. So there's a disconnect between the neuro neurodiversity narrative and the experience of severely aff affected autistics. So are we gonna hear from the severely affected autistics? Who I'm sure are a key part of this, this group, the National Council on Severe Autism. Right? I have two kids with nonverbal autism, said Jill Escher, founding president of the organization. It's an extremely severe neurodevelopmental disability. They can't talk, can't read or write, can't add one plus one, and lack any capacity for abstract thought. Neurodiversity advocates trivialize this and cherry pick naive, feel good stories that portray autism falsely instead of grappling with the reality. Some aspects of the movement are very convenient for all autism advocates because we all want to portray our children in a way that will engender acceptance. My kid's having a meltdown at the supermarket or taking his clothes off or screaming. I want people to appreciate that his behavior comes out of a difference in his brain wiring. But do I think his behavior and wiring is natural? Absolutely not. What is it then? Synthetic? Uh, which, what do you mean, do I think it's natural? Like, of course it's bloody natural. Like, oh. What else would it be? Genetics is nature. Like, oh. Jill Escher believes that autism is primarily caused by toxic pollutants affecting the germ cell. So she's a staunch proponent of one of the bad autism ideas that the author listed at the start of the article. So yeah. Anyway, let's have a look at the National Council on Severe Autism. Okay, they have a YouTube channel. I see Sia. Sia. Oh no. Sia's autism and what does autism mean anyway? Oh, whack. Let's have a look at this. I look different again because it's a whole new day. This video is taking a lot longer to film than I thought it would. So where was I? I was looking at um, this Jill Escher, the National Council on Severe Autism, who have a YouTube channel in which we are treated to gems like this. I don't know, Sia. I've, I've read a little bit about her. I've seen a couple of interviews with her. I would never give her a diagnosis of autism. How is it that somebody who is extremely capable, extremely competent verbally, competent socially, competent in terms of her functionality, I'm sure she is quirky, I'm sure that she is very sensitive, but why in the world does that have to be labeled autism? It is so utterly meaningless that, you know, this highly successful, articulate person who's completely functional can adopt that term and not a single member of the media questions it. And you have this crazy um, kind of performance art on Twitter by the neurodiversity warriors. Sia has so completely capitulated to the neuromob. Anyway, uh, the other thing I want to I wanted mention about um, the bullying industrial complex on Twitter, how cruel, the abject cruelty of it. It's not just that they're irrational. It's one thing to be irrational. It's one thing to say, oh, you know, this film promotes violence against people with autism, which is completely unhinged, right? Sia, don't expect the entire autism community to welcome you with open arms after what you've done to them with your god-awful ableist movie by making them look horrible. Oh, um, here. Um, can we not invalidate Sia's autism just because we don't like her? Here, Sia is autistic. No way girly produced the most insensitive autism de depiction in a movie just to be autistic herself. I'm not even sure what that means, but that's crazy. But now, Sia has autism. Hey, listen, Sia has something, I'm sure. Why do we have to call it autism? Um, you know, on the IAC, uh, which is the, the Federal Advisory Committee on Autism, um, it's heavily stacked by people who quote unquote have autism or represent autism, but really just those who but are high functioning. Yeah. So, I mean, they had this, they ran this article. Doctors with autism speak out against stigma. All right. So, uh, never mind the fact that neither of my children even understand what a doctor is. 
<laughs> uh, but you know, they use doctors with autism. And here we, why is this the label? Why, why can't we come up with something else? It's become almost, it's sadly almost like faddish to, um, for individuals who have the types of challenges that are described in that article to uh, adopt the term of, you know, to identify as um, being autistic. And I think that autism had taken on kind of this character of like, almost like a fantasy, like, you know, a gift, like it's actually, it's special to be this way. And, you know, you, you bring something like special and unique to the world that other people don't have. And it's become kind of cool and interesting to be neurodivergent. I won't mention names, but there are those quote unquote autistic doctors. Of course, I don't see a speck of autism in these people, but whatever, um, you know, who, who, who have been antagonistic towards those who speak out on behalf of the severely affected, um, you know, kind of saying that we're not treating them with dignity. We're not treating them with respect. We're disparaging them when all we're doing is communicating their reality. What about another diagnosis for, you know, these people who are so super functional, so super successful? Is there anything in the book that could be applied instead of autism, some kind of personality? disorder, maybe a mix of sensory disorder and anxiety disorder, or like what? And, and I would say that that particular side of the equation of neurodiversity is extremely problematic. And, and, and I would say that it even uh, hurt many, many autistic individuals. Well, definitely, you know, uh, we are of the opinion that um, it's absolutely imperative that we better understand the origins of autism. Um, wow. We still don't have a means for preventing autism. And so, you know, and, and but, you know, we do have this sort of rabid core of neurodiversity advocates who would seem perfectly content to throw all of that under the bus. Under, right. for the dogma, you know, because of the dogma that autism is supposedly just a natural difference. Where, where there's no, there's no evidence for that. I, I have engaged many people from Neuro Life diversity and, and sometimes it has been hard to debate them uh, because they are simply blind to uh, other people's opinion. I, I, I would say that there's a lot of noise out there because many neurodiversity proponents that claim to be autistic are really not autistics, okay? And you have to be very careful. Uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, I agree. So, so some of the people that go into the soapbox mm -hmm. and uh, start claiming that all of their problems have been due by society instead of uh, getting responsibility, their own responsibility for their problems. Uh, some of them have uh, really deep personality disorders and they see the world in terms of black and white, yes or no. And you cannot debate that type of uh, individual. The funny thing to me is, all this talk of how militant the neurodiversity movement is and these people are so adamant about real autism being the exact thing they say it is. Like Jill Escher pointing at randos and saying they can't be autistic based on her limited perception from a distance is so at odds with the scientific view of diagnosis. It's anti-science and authoritative behaviour in itself. I just think it's a bit on the nose that we are talking in this essay about like people on Twitter and they're being mean, they're being militant, they're harassing people and and and, and it's it's harming the world. <laughs> and one of the primary sources for this essay is a woman who like, I'm sure she does some good things. I think it says on a website that she provides housing for people, so that's probably good. But I just find it, as I say, a bit on the nose that one of the first videos I click on is her sort of just showing the tweets, the Twitter handles of random autistic people going, oh, look how terrible all this is. It's like, these people aren't really autistic. See, is not really autistic. It's just, that's not professional behaviour, is it? To just be like, these, these strangers on the internet that I know nothing about can't be autistic. Who are you? And I think this is sort of why we often see the elimination of those people who are diagnosed with ASD2 in these conversations. They're completely ignored, completely out of the question, because what they need to do is, as I've said, divide autistic people back into classic autism and Asperger's syndrome. That's what they want. They want it to be categorized differently. But as I've explained, and as multiple autism researchers have explained, autism doesn't work like that. It's not this static thing that you get given a level and then you're on that level forever. That See, look here. The neurodiversity movement is dividing both the autism community and autism researchers. This is this is funny because if autism researchers are divided on this, then it's not the case that this is like 
the neurodiversity movement versus experts and parents, is it? Because that's how they want to frame this. It's on one hand, it's high functioning autistic people on Twitter versus parents of kids with very high care needs and science. <laughs> like, like the author of the article said, where is it? The idea that autism is a variation of normal is at odds with scientific understanding of the condition. So here he's, he's pitting it as like science over here, neurodiversity movement over here. They want to create a false division between autistic self-advocates on one side and parents, carers and researchers on the other. As if there are no actually autistic parents of autistic kids with high care needs. There are Facebook groups full of autistic parents to autistic kids doing incredible advocacy, offering support, advice and resources to other parents. Autistic parents who are creating affirming spaces that incorporate the neurodiversity model. Autistic parents who are, every single day, highlighting the stark reality of their lives, discussing their challenges and processes offering support to other exhausted parents without dehumanizing their children, without disregarding their kids' privacy, without acting like having a disabled kid is the biggest tragedy a family could face. There are autistic autism researchers doing incredible work, and importantly, there are so many self-advocates who are non-speaking or who have learning disabilities that you should be listening to if you're not already. I keep talking about this, but unfortunately I still need to prove this point to so many people. So I have compiled a non-exhaustive list of self-advocacy groups and individual advocates for you to check out as a starting point. Advocates make the distinction between autistics and neurotypicals or non-autistics. Autistic is the word for non-autistic, not neurotypical. Neurotypical is somebody who is not neurodivergent. This fosters an us versus them mentality, wherein non-autistic people are regarded as an oppressive enemy. It also fosters intolerance towards different ways of thinking about autism, as well as a deep and unhealthy mistrust of the scientific and medical communities. Again, here's this idea that there's no, there's, there's no one in the scientific community who is supportive of the neurodiversity model, which is just not true. Like he's not giving any examples about like what different ways of thinking about autism are um, intolerated, are not tolerated. That's because it's usually like dehumanizing language. Talking about autism as being an epidemic. People like the founder of Autism Speaks talking about how she wanted to murder her own child right in front of her own child. Or things like parents who learn their kids autistic and then grieve and lament the child that they lost, the, the future imaginary hypothetical kid that they lost. Like, these are dehumanizing, oppressive ways of speaking about autistic people that are being pushed back against. A different way of thinking about autism. We've tried the different ways of thinking about autism, like, stop acting like we haven't done all the other, like, like I said, all that bad science that he talked about was a result of mainstream scientific study of autism. It's not like neurotypical ableist assumptions about autism haven't been given a chance. <laughs> They're on the cusp. Any day now, they'll figure it out and make all of our lives better. Are we ready to get very angry? <laughs> this is a sentence and a half. Ironically, a social justice movement that aims to highlight the ways in which autistic people have been mistreated by society is now directly responsible for the mistreatment of the most vulnerable of all autistics, many of whom are too severely affected by their condition to speak up for themselves. Directly responsible for the mistreatment. In standing up for their rights, a group of marginalized people are effectively hyper-marginalizing the very people they claim to be advocating for. They have monopolized the public discourse on autism and continue to do whatever they can to silence any dissenting voices. This inability to debate and try to reach a compromise is a problem not only for the autistic community, but for wider society. This is 
this is this is upsetting <laughs> i'm upset this paragraph is ripe with ableist assumptions and wanting in examples or evidence or links or anything this article and sabina's video and so much of the anti-neurodiversity crowd outright assume that people with ASD3, people who are non-speaking or minimally speaking, are not an active part of the neurodiversity movement. And autistic people, especially autistic people with high care needs, neurodivergent people with learning disabilities and high care needs, are mistreated by society to the point where their lives are at risk. They are being murdered. They're being murdered by their families, by law enforcement, by institutions. Nowhere in this article does he talk about autistic people losing their lives at the hands of professionals, parents and law enforcement, schools even. Nowhere in this article does he talk about the types of experts who told this autistic woman, told her family that she, she basically couldn't do anything with her life and that she'll need guardianship for the rest of her life. Nowhere really in this essay or in Sabina's video do they discuss and analyse the very real dangers facing autistic people especially those with very high care needs, yes. But they don't go into it, they're not... Oh, they some undefined social model and... Oh, they're blaming mistreatment on society and... Yeah, okay, historically, I guess this was the case. <laughs> but no, the neurodiversity movement is now directly responsible for the mistreatment of the most vulnerable of all autistics. They have monopolised the public discourse on autism and continue to do whatever they can to silence any dissenting voices as if Autism Speaks are not still the biggest autism charity in the world. As if Light It Up Blue campaigns and like the other gimmicky stuff you see in Autism Awareness Month, as if that isn't still extremely prevalent and mainstream, despite most autistic people saying that that does nothing for them. By the way, I must say, if you think that different ways of thinking isn't tolerated in neurodivergent spaces, then that's just another clear indication to me that you've never spent any time in any. People who hold bigoted views always do this though, don't they? They see that members of a marginalised group are all united in being opposed to them and their bigoted views, and so they assume that it's some kind of groupthink. Like, well, they all seem to think the same thing about me. I guess they all think the same thing about everything. Like, no, your shitty takes are just a common denominator. Sorry. They have monopolised the public discourse on autism. The social justice movement that aims to highlight the ways in which autistic people have been mistreated by society has monopolised the public discourse on autism. Who should? Like, first of all, I don't think it has, as I've said, mainstream autism charities, which are largely considered to be quite harmful by a lot of autistic people. They're still very prevalent. They still get a lot of funding. ABA is still a huge industry in America. So I don't think the public discourse has been monopolized by the social justice movement that aims to highlight the ways in which autistic people have been mistreated by society, but if it had, how is that a bad thing? Who should be on the stage? Who should have the cameras pointed at them? I mean, it's not those who are too severely affected by their condition, because as you say, they can't speak for themselves. Something else I disagree with, they do speak for themselves, you're just not listening. If you think that non-speaking autistic people have no voice, it's because you're not listening. I know that the people that they're saying can't speak for themselves, I know that they are an active part in the neurodiversity movement and that they are an active part in the autism self-advocacy movement. But 
you're the one, he's the one, insisting that these people, they couldn't, they couldn't possibly, they couldn't possibly be a part of this movement. They can't even speak for themselves. You're the one insisting that. But you're also suggesting that people like me, people who do speak, we shouldn't. So who should? Neurotypical parents, neurotypical researchers, people who have zero first-hand experience of autism, they should be the ones. They should be the ones that people listen to when it comes to autism. That's the conclusion to this whole discussion. It also poses a major problem for autism research. Again, assuming that there aren't a bunch of neurodiversity affirming autistic and otherwise neurodivergent autism researchers out there doing great work which is actually benefiting the lives of autistic people who would have thought and again back to that essay that shows that actually not having a neurodiversity framework of understanding and not checking neurotypical bias when it comes to researching autism is the main thing that has posed major problems for autism research traditional forms of autism research where it's autistic people being observed from the outside and tr people trying to figure out what makes us tick that is proving fruitless the fact that traditional forms of autism research have proved fruitless for decades is not the fault of the neurodiversity movement scientists are now beginning to realize that there is a selection bias against autistics with intellectual disabilities throughout all fields of autism research although nearly half of the autistic population also has an intellectual disability the majority of research is focused on those with relatively intact language and cognition thus individuals considered to be low functioning are being overlooked by the research community okay so after looking at the reports that he linked like this one is a meta-analysis that just says like yeah there's a selection bias against intellectual disabilities um but this one offers some explanation it suggests here that a desire to study a pure form of autism uncomplicated by potentially confounding factors is likely contributed as well. Also, the gap in the literature is exacerbated in the domain of human neuroimaging, where a high degree of behavioural compliance is often necessary to obtain usable data. Okay, so they're acknowledging that autism and intellectual disabilities and other comorbid disabilities are different things. And so if you're studying autism, you want to study autism. So if you're looking at autism research, you're going to see people who have co-occurring disabilities underrepresented because that makes it difficult to study the autism. Whether that's a good thing or not, I'm not, I don't know, but it seems to make sense from a methodological viewpoint but also um, that the gap is exacerbated by neuroimaging which requires the subject to be able to sit still in a very stressful situation if we're talking MRIs it's scary almost <laughs> it's very overwhelming it's very stressful and you have to be still that is obviously going to be easier for people who are diagnosed with ASD 1 and 2 than it will be for people diagnosed with ASD 3 or who have co-occurring disabilities. It's not because the neurodiversity movement have their thumb on the scale. Like he's just, he's just kind of like, cause he said, oh, it's like, it's bad for research and a bunch of the people like Jill Ashley she goes on about it's bad for research um and then so he has to kind of back that up with something but like the two have nothing to do with each other it's not got that has not got anything to do with the neurodiversity movement and if any of these people bothered to do even a cursory look they would see the autistic self-advocate organizations are 
incorporating otherwise disabled autistic people into their research are incorporating autistic people with intellectual disabilities into their focus grouping and their decision making. If any of these people bothered to look, they would see that. And I'll show you, I just, well, we're almost at the end of the article, so. The movement is harmful because they're trying to terrorise people into silence. And we're just a few of the many victims of their bullying and smear campaigns, Escher said. You, you, you sit there on YouTube pointing at strangers online when you're not autistic talking about how insane and irrational autistic people are on Twitter. But no, no, you're the victim of the disabled people who are trying to terrorise you into silence. She spends most of the time on her podcast thing like smiling and laughing about just how insane and irrational the neurodiversity advocates are. She doesn't seem terrorised into silence to me. The ableist language just spewing from her the whole time is quite something to behold. There's a toll on scientific research too because the neurodiversity platform apparently doesn't believe it's important to investigate the causes of autism. Again, it's not like people have not been investigating the causes of autism. Decades and decades of research, most of which has been directly harmful to autistic people. And again, lots and lots of autism research is going on by autistic people, by otherwise neurodivergent people, with the autistic individual in mind. It is, therefore, time to start thinking differently about neurodiversity and to recognise the importance of free speech in the public discourse on autism. There it is. There it is. There it is. This is free speech. It's free speech. Oh, you autistic people, shut up. This is about free speech. Because if neurodiversity means anything. It means accepting that we all think differently and that not everyone takes pride in being autistic. If it means anything. I mean, yeah, accepting that we all think differently, sure. Accepting that there's, what, no scientific consensus on stuff? No such thing as truth, no... Are we, are, we, are we plunging ourselves into radical subjectivism? Because <laughs> I don't think the author of this essay wants that somehow. Um, because we're obviously thinking wrong. Because we're directly harming society's most vulnerable people. They're doing that thing that, that bigots like to do where they go, oh, oh this this marginalised group in society has so much power. They are completely derailing all of science. They are dictating public policy. They are terrorising innocent people into silence. It just absolutely zero self-awareness whatsoever. But no, not everyone takes pride in being autistic. You don't need to be proud to be autistic. You don't need to be proud of anything. I'm proud of myself as an autistic person for achieving what I've achieved, for making it through a lot of struggle. I'm proud of myself for that. But you may or may not be proud of your autism, but that's neither here nor there. So no, probably not everyone takes pride in being autistic and that is fine. Says me, a neurodiversity advocate. If you're happy being autistic and think of it as part of your identity, that's great. And I don't want to upset you or hurt you. But don't tell me I can't try to help ease my son's suffering, said Hall. For them, autism is a life-altering, cruel disability and I'd do anything to help them feel good and give them a better quality of life. I'm not going to argue with a father saying that he wants to give his sons a good quality of life. I don't think any neurodiversity advocate would say, hey, father, don't you try and help ease your son's suffering. If the way you're trying to ease their suffering is like forcing them into ABA for their whole life or 
posting videos of their meltdowns on the internet or stuff like that, then I could understand people maybe criticizing that. I don't, I'm not saying this dad does that, I'm just saying I've never heard an autism advocate go, hey, don't try and ease your kid's suffering. <laughs> but rather that a lot of things that neurotypical people think might help autistic people might actually be harming them. And we have decades and decades and decades and decades of easily accessible scientific literature backing that up. Neurodiversity advocates ignore the harsh realities of severe autism and want to forget about my sons and others like them. We want to forget about his sons and others like them. He added, they've done a good job of hijacking the message and monopolizing the discourse and are controlling the narrative so tightly that people like my sons will have no choice in the world. What does that mean? Thomas Clements, it's Thomas again, <laughs> echoes this sentiment. As he wrote in The Guardian last month, it's not last month, this is old. The trivialization of autism by neurodiversity advocates comes at the expense of those at the lower end of the spectrum, like his brother Jack. Again, that's not how the spectrum works. But are we? Have we forgotten about people like his sons? Let's have a look at the Autistic Self Advocacy Network, who um, as he mentions here, have advised federal government policymakers as an example of the neurodiversity movement getting its grubby little fingers all over public policy. Okay, so here is the Autistic Self Advocacy Network Strategic Goals 2021 to 2024. First page, overarching goals, all means all. ASAN will fight for the inclusion of non-speaking autistics autistic people with intellectual disabilities, institution survivors, and autistic people with high support needs or multiple disabilities. ASAM will advocate for policies that ensure the civil and human rights, inclusion and dignity of all autistic people regardless, regardless of our support needs, ability to use oral speech or additional disabilities. ASAM will deepen our partnerships with organisations led by people who use AAC, that's Augmentative and Alternative Communication, or people who have intellectual disabilities, as well as other disability rights organisations focused on serving people with developmental disabilities. We will deepen our partnership with organisations led by these people. ASAN will increase the number of ASAN staff and board members who use AAC or who have intellectual disabilities. In addition to our continuing work on easy read, video, and other cognitively accessible resources, ASAM will deepen our commitment to cognitive accessibility and will explore additional ways to include autistic people who cannot currently access these resources. ASAM will address lateral and internalized ableism within the autistic community by promoting a culture of inclusive self-advocacy which centers non-speaking autistics, autistic people with intellectual disabilities, institution survivors, and autistic people with high support needs or multiple disabilities. We will continue to prioritize these parts of our community in our policy work and programming. We will use our social media presence to amplify their perspectives. They want to forget about my sons and other Others like him. So this is an example of ASAN's easy read versions of their literature. So here you find their goals, um, how they're going to do it. They're going to do survey. They do surveys every year, and the, what they're going to ask about in the surveys. And some examples of things that you can answer with, all with visual aids, all with very accessible language. Also, they're also going to make it available in Spanish. We will think about how to share the survey with people who cannot use the internet. So this is all just it's sort of explaining what they're all about, what they do, why they do it, ways that they're trying to be better, designed for people who need these things to be more accessible. We will make sure the focus group includes non-speaking autistic people. We will make sure the focus group includes autistic people with intellectual disabilities. We will make sure people have accommodations if they need to be part of the group. We will hold more focus groups in the future. Some focus groups will be for autistic people with intellectual disabilities. Some focus groups will be for non-speaking autistic people. We will include autistic people of colour in every focus group. We know that a focus group will be a lot of work for people in them. We want to pay people for their work. 
we will pay the people who attend our focus groups. We will also have listening sessions. Listening sessions are big meetings where we listen to the community. We want to hold listening sessions with autistic people of colour, with non-speaking autistic people, with autistic people with intellectual disabilities. All in all, this article is bad. One problem that I think um, these people have is that they hear the word natural and think good. I don't think autism has a, a moral value. <laughs> I don't think it's good or bad, but it is natural. And I think a lot of people are just falling into that, what's it, the natural, naturalistic fallacy or whatever. The naturalistic fallacy, the idea that what is found in nature is good. And I, I think that's, that's the problem. They hear neurodiversity advocate saying brains are naturally diverse and then they hear any kind of neurodivergency is good. I don't think that. I don't think that autism is the next step in human evolution or a superpower or makes us better than neurotypical people. And I know there are people online who talk in that way, but People online say all kinds of crap. Like if we're gonna if we're gonna start panicking about what this means for society when like teenagers do bad tweets, then you know, I don't know. I, I do I think it's extremely worrying when grown adults make these sweeping generalizations about society based on their timeline on Twitter. It but no, I don't think that I think it's just a thing that is there's always been disabled people. There always will be disabled people. It's not good, it's not bad, it just is. Mm -hmm.